<laughs> Certainly appreciate the presence of everyone here. I know a lot of you had to travel some long distances. We're very, very pleased that you your journey was safe. And uh, Daryl Brooking, just glad he got here. <laughs> I think he had about a 12 or 14 hour flight from uh, Tennessee, but he finally made it, so we're very happy about that. I think we have a uh, very exciting agenda plan, very informative, and we certainly appreciate the attendance of everyone that's here. We do ask that if you have a cell phone, you know, please be sure and silence it in some fashion or another. Either set it to vibrate or stomp on it, one or the other. We don't want to be disturbing others during our uh, lectures. I'll have more to say in the uh, second session about the uh, uh, lectureship book and CD. So please stay around for that. Uh, we will have breaks between sessions. I want to remind all of you with small children to be sure, or even big children, be sure that they eat only in the, in the big room in the back. Do not uh, eat in any in the classrooms or upstairs. Stay away from those areas. And make the parents responsible for that. If you, if you allow your kids to eat in those areas, then we're going to do one of two things. First of all, we thought about going ahead and selling them off into slavery. <laughs> well, we think really a more effective way is to give you all the kids, you have to take them all home with you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just uh, if you would please observe that uh, rule and it'll make things go easier on cleanup and, and what have you. Like I say, I'll have more to say about the uh, lectureship uh, books and material in the second session. During this first session, uh, John West will lead us in a song, and then Buddy Roth, one of our elders, will lead us in an opening prayer, and then at that time I will introduce the uh, speaker. So, John. You would get a songbook and turn to number 420. 420 will be our first song. Whatever you do and word or be do all in the name of the Lord. Do Thank <laughs> you. 
Our Lord and Father, we thank you so much for the blessings of this life. Most of all, Father, we thank you for the Christ, for the sacrifice that he made on our behalf that makes all this possible. It makes possible our fellowship one with another and being in fellowship with you. Father, as we search the scriptures, we endeavor to find the authority for everything that we do so that we might truly do all in the name of the Lord. Father, we ask your blessing upon this event. We thank you for all the speakers who have come our way and all our visitors that we have this morning. We trust that it will, this event will have far-reaching effects now and down through time as long as this world may stand. Father, again, we thank you for Jesus, and it's his name we pray. Amen. The theme for our lectureship this year is Unity from God or Man. Again, a very timely subject. And our first speaker this morning will be David Brown. He, of course, is a preacher here at Spring Church Christ. He's speaking to us on the topic of union and diversity. It contradicts the New Testament uh, uh, unity. David has been with us here about 14, 15 years, about 15 years. So that means that for about 25 years we've had a Brown preaching here. We certainly appreciate the uh, talent that and David has acquired from years of study and, and uh, preaching for the stand for the truth that he has taken. And when it comes to preaching, he's, you know, he's stronger than pickle juice. And we appreciate that here. And I think that the church would be in a lot better shape today if there were elderships and preachers who possessed the same love and and uh, desire for following the truth that David Brown does. I think we are blessed here to be able to have him. Uh, it has made us who love the truth better for it. And because of the stand that he is taking, we have provided elders for about five or ten congregations around here. I don't know. <laughs> This is a sad uh, thing about the, the church is that, you know, they're not strong enough in the faith to be members here, but they're strong enough to be elders elsewhere. <laughs> sad, sad shape of the uh, church. But again, we, we appreciate uh, David. Uh, we have a very close and cordial uh, working relationship with the elders, and I think we, the elders, consider him a friend in addition to working him on behalf of the church and the, the Lord and the gospel. So we appreciate that. He is uh, also the editor, and he and I are the co-owners of Thing for the Faith. And he has many other endeavors also, many lectures that he attends, uh, many articles that he writes. You know, he goes to his office during the day and stays there all day long working at his computer. So he's an extremely busy person, but we appreciate what he does on behalf of the Lord. Married to the uh, former Joanne Langdon has gobs of grandkids, more than one man should have. <laughs> has gobs of grandkids, so uh, we certainly appreciate his talent. And David, if you come speak to us, please. Well, first of all, let me say that it's always a joy to be a part of any endeavor to proclaim the gospel and defend the faith, wherever it may be. But it is especially a joy and a privilege to fill this pulpit. Many battles have been fought by this congregation. And because of what these elders are, I believe we've been able to go through them successfully, letting all things be done according to the authority of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Brother Ken was very kind to me in saying what he did regarding our relationship, that is the relationship with the, that I have with the elders and they with me. And I can only say that whatever he said about me, I can say it doubly over about the elders. Uh, they're not only faithful elders, shepherds of the flock and all the New Testament teaches, 
Well, they are, dear friend. And yet I have no doubt that if I were to transgress in some way from the faith, that they'd let me know about it. And that's one reason they're my friends. That's what it is to be a friend in Jesus. That your emotions and your friendship doesn't eclipse the authority of the Word of God. It causes you to adhere to it. And I have always believed that regarding my life as a Christian, as a preacher of the gospel and the work that I've done, that when I say in the song, I'll be a friend to Jesus, that means I'll be a friend to the body of Christ that he shed his blood to purchase. And the greatest friend you can be to anybody is to show them the way of salvation and then to exemplify it in your conduct. I can't think of a better friend than that. There are people who bear with you, put up with you. The elders do that with me. And then my wife's the next one that does that. She uh, stands by and works and does so much that I, I have no way to properly express my appreciation for what this help suitable has been to me over the 40, nearly 40 some odd years that I've been preaching and primarily 30 something of them since we've been married. Appreciate it so much. We're glad you're here. We hope that what's being done this week will be to the glory of God. And whether it satisfies people or not, let it be to the glory of God. Let it be well pleasing in his sight. And then all those who want to please God will be very happy with it. And those who don't want to please God, they need to learn to please God. That's life. That's what it's all about. So I hope you'll be with us, continue to pray for us, and that we might be able to truly be one as the Bible teaches we should be. Union and diversity, I put that in quotes, contradicts New Testament unity. Union and diversity contradicts New Testament unity. And I'll say more about that in a moment, why I chose to do that. But let us emphasize what I think everybody in this room already knows. It is a matter of biblical fact that God expects Christians to be united. Jesus prayed for it. John 17, verses 20 through 23. Paul, in no uncertain terms, commanded it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. Yet, as far as the world is concerned, it claims Christ as Savior. Their whole concept of Christianity is based on sectarian denominationalism. They don't see what the Bible really has to say regarding unity. They try to interpret it to justify what I have called union in diversity relative to what one must do to be saved from his or her sins and to be a faithful child of God even as to what a Christian is and the definition of it. So we this week will be presenting the truth regarding these matters and in so doing we will be also obeying Jude verse 3 of contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. We intend to expose and refute any doctrine that arrays itself against whatever the Bible teaches, but especially this week concerning our theme, the biblical doctrine of unity. We have no authority to tamper with, to meddle with the truth of God's word, and we're not going to do it. That's just wrong. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. For those that know the Bible to be the very word of the living God, and the reason it's given, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. But when you look back, read your Bible, it is also a biblical fact that in the years following the establishment of the church, Acts chapter 2, even as the New Testament itself was being written and the gospel being spread throughout the world, brethren were beginning to accept lies in the place of truth and in the place of the divine and fallible New Testament teaching on a numerous things. In fact, it's interesting that God in his infinite wisdom in giving us the New Testament, most of which is written to churches and to individuals, saw fit to give us those things as problems arose within the churches. And he gave us his truth as he gave rebukes to those who brought them up and Paul and others, such as the Judaizing teachers, false teachers who said the Gentiles could be saved by Christ, but they must be circumcised, keep the law. Those things were refuted. We learned so much about the design and purpose of the law because Paul and others were refuting 
the false teaching about that. So it bothers me a great deal today when I hear people trying to say, well, you know, you're too issue-oriented. Folks, the New Testament was written in the midst of the orientation, if you want to call it that, to be involved with issues. Anything that goes against the authority of Jesus Christ is wrong and must be confronted by faithful Christians. We're going to have more to say about that in a moment. So when it comes to the unity for which Christ prayed, and most of those who believe in Christ have accepted them the following premises. As long as Christians agree on something, then there's unity. That's basically it on a lot of things. Just agree on it. Have you come to an agreement, then there's unity. Well, it's even, it's even worse than that. Many others don't even believe in being united on anything. And yet you still just get along to get along. That's out there in the world. It's very much in the church today been growing in the church for many, many years. And to act like that these things don't exist anymore, as one fellow said about the churches in Nashville that liberalism's over with, is ridiculous. It's, it's absurd. It's ignorant. Especially for somebody like William Woodson to say such a thing as that. So we're interested in what the Bible teaches, and thus we're interested in noticing that the union that I'm talking about in diversity, being different, contradicts the teaching of the Bible on unity, on unity. So what they call unity and diversity is really no unity at all, and that's the reason I call it union. A union. It's a union of diverse and contradictory beliefs. And for such an outfit the Lord never prayed. It's not there. If you think he did, then you need to re-examine your thinking, your understanding of the Bible that you believe teaches such a thing as that. The apostles never commanded such a view. So we need to study what the Bible has to teach us about the unity of God that he expects all people everywhere who would come to him through Jesus Christ to, to believe and to follow. And surely the unity that he commanded, and Paul did, in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, and the platform for unity that will be discussed more later on in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. Surely that unity is the same oneness or unity for which the Lord prayed in John 17, 20, and 21, and which Paul commanded. And that if we're going to be faithful to the Lord, we will preserve, let come what may, and no matter the sacrifices. Now, let's move further into this. When you see what I've written, I spend a great deal of time, or at least some time, on the proper disposition of heart, the attitude, the mindset one ought to have in dealing with brethren and approaching God and approaching his word, and the long-suffering that ought to be there and what is meant by long-suffering as you preach the word and your long-suffering as you do it. And then I deal somewhat with the matter of the platform for unity in the Plank Senate in Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 6. But having done that, and others will be dealing with some of that, we need to emphasize, based upon that too, that Christianity is the re religion of biblical authority. Now, right there, you remove yourself from a great many people as to their viewpoint of the Bible. They simply say, well, here's the Bible, it's God's Word, and that's fine, but what do they mean by it? What does that imply in their own mind as to their approach to it and what they're going to get out of it, even how they study it? So if we're to learn, if we're to learn about Christian unity, about the unity that the Lord prayed for and Paul commanded, there is no way to do that except that we learn uh, that the Bible is a book of authority in general and the New Testament specifically where you find the Lord's authority. Matthew 28:18, Colossians 3:17. We must then learn about how to ascertain it and we must learn to respect it. And anybody will not learn to respect the authority of God presented in the meaning of the words of the Bible handled correctly, 2 Timothy 2:15, is not going to be a Christian or at least they won't as they do become one remain faithful very long. They must learn how to ascertain it. They must learn what it authorizes us to do. They must learn that that is faith, proper, correct, scriptural response to Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, knowing that no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. That it is the re proper response of a proper, correct, biblical love to God and his word. We must understand that. John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
When we do the things I've just mentioned, then we'll discover our obligations to God regarding our salvation need, but if we don't, we won't. So until we learn what the Bible is, how it teaches, how to handle it correctly, how to ascertain his authority, how to respect it, the desire to obey Christ, to understand what it means to call him King and Lord, that means then that I am subservient to him in all things that I will obey him no matter the sacrifices I must make, we'll never understand the unity for which Christ prayed and Paul commanded. So we must be willing to discharge those obligations regardless of the sacrifices we must make in order to do so. Or family, friend, family and friends lost in order to be obedient to God. Again, I must emphasize, because it permeates our society and to a great extent the church, that many believers in Jesus Christ have a false concept of love. To them, it is simply a sick sentimentalism, a subjectivism. It's a romanticism. It's better felt than told, and that permeates our whole society. It's in the church. It's even in so-called conservative churches more than people realize. But true Bible love always leaves people, as I said a moment ago in quoting Jesus, always, in every case, leaves people to obey the precepts and mandates of our King. Anything you call love that allows you to excuse yourself and doing God's will is not love. I don't care how good you feel in it. Or how many people tell you you're the best thing under the sun for not discharging God's will. Then you're wrong, and you're going to be lost And after a while. Love, as the Bible sets it out, as Jesus talked about it, as it's defined, will lead you in every case to obey God's will. Let me just simply say this. What is the loving thing to do? Do what God told you. Yeah, but that means I can't do this and I can't do that and I can't be what I used to be with these people and I do what God told me. If you love me, keep my commandments. The loving thing to do is to do what God told us. That's what love is. Now, who is, who is it that gave us the Bible? God. Who is God? Well, John, my inspiration said God is love. Now think about what God did for us and think about the loving thing to do and think about the loving thing to do in the life of Christ and you'll see then that he submitted to God's will and everything to perfection. And look what it cost him. But he did it and if he hadn't done it, we wouldn't be here this morning. So we learn a most important lesson about scriptural relation, the scriptural relationship of love to authority. It's one that the world doesn't really know. And too many in the church don't understand it. That is the principle of love that is so great never rises higher or sets aside the authority principle set out in God's Word. The love of which Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 always leads one to submit to whatever it is that God has authorized. Thereby men are obligated to do what God requires of them in order to be saved from their alien sins. And thereby they become, of course, Christians. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Christians only and the only Christians of the church Jesus built. Added to it by the Lord himself, Acts 2, 47, and therein to serve under the principles of truth set out by the king. Thus we become a Christian and faithfully live the Christian life. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So all of this being said, we affirm that the only primary source of information for us in order to study the matter of unity is the Bible, rightly divided. Thus we sang the song a moment ago that we're all familiar with, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, which means by his authority, Colossians 3.17. So specifically we're looking for unity of the oneness as set out by Jesus Christ, who has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28.18. Not any other kind. So this means that the student must know how to rightly divide the word of truth, I say again. It's interesting to note that at the beginning of the restoration of the ancient order of things, the early part of the 19th century, when it began to take hold, that that was the first move made by those folks. What is the final standard of authority in all things religious more? If they hadn't settled on that, there wouldn't have been a restoration of anything else. They would have just been content with denominationalism as it had been all the way up from the Protestant Reformation and so on. So we need to understand that we must find the final authority in religion. If I love you... I'm going to try to get you to understand God's will or what is the final, absolute, objective authority for man and religion. And if you love me, you're going to do the same thing. If what you have did not come from God, then don't try to teach it as if it did. And the same would apply to me. So we've got to begin by saying, is this book I follow a revelation of God's word? And if you love me, you're going to 
try to show me the proofs that it is. It's just the way it works. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, First Thessalonians 5, 21. And this has a great bearing on the unity for which Christ prayed and Paul commanded the Bible teaches. So let us realize that we conclude, that we must conclude, that where ignorance of, of God's Word or lack of appreciation and respect for the authority of God's Word or the right division of God's Word, where that exists, there can't be the unity that Jesus prayed for and Paul commanded. To seek the unity of believers in Christ on any other basis than the New Testament authority is a futile thing and it was destined to fail and always will. And with it, there will be thousands upon thousands upon thousands multiplied over and over again of souls lost forevermore because the devil is persuaded this otherwise. So the truth of the matter is this. You cannot prove God's love or man's love for God, man's love for God, and the things that are of God, except that we render obedience to God's Word. If we were to get, we might get more people to understand and see the importance of what New Testament Christianity really is, if we could first of all get them to understand that. It's not a matter of saying God exists, Christ is the Son of God, He saves us, He loves us, the Bible is the Word of God, it is all wonderful, and everybody do pretty much as they please as long as you'll just confess that. They've got to realize that God put this book here to be understood and for it to guide our lives. And people with free will, there's automatically a conflict if you don't watch out. So unless there's the attitude that says, and my will is set aside in every case where I see it in conflict with God's will is set out in the New Testament. There's not going to be unity. And when job security and friends and prestige and all that stuff gets to be more important, then I'm going to try to figure out a way to justify myself in God's eyes and everybody else's while I violate God's will. That's what I'll try to do. It works that way every time. Now, all of that being said, I want to read something from a fellow by the name of Dallas Burdett. His background is in the Annie Bible class and uh, those who contend for one cup, meaning one container, and split the church over all of that. And yet now, in his seeking unity and not liking what that caused in that faction, he's now moved over to where he embraces the Rubel Shelley, Randy Harris, Max Lucado, ACU, all that kind of stuff that we're talking about. And really, it's union in diversity, but not unity in diversity as commanded by Paul, where we're to be of the same mind and the same judgment. They were to think the same way and so on. And he well defines what we mean when we use the term union in diversity. So let me read to you some of the quote. The whole thing's in the book, but it's rather lengthy, so I'll read the part that really, really deals with what I'm talking about. He starts off by saying, the brief analysis of unity in Jesus demonstrates that imperfection in understanding does not, in and of itself, warrant the stigma of false prophets as a result of misinterpretation. That's the reason he's going to say that. He wants to try to reach over here into the various anti-factions without them giving up their views and have them all still united. Well, may I remind you, he's showing, and you'll see this later on as time allows, he is showing a complete lack of understanding on how to ascertain Bible authority and how the Bible operates. He's saying something here that says, I don't accept that the Bible sets out what man's obligations are. And I don't see the difference of those obligations and in expediting those obligations through various options that may very well differ. Now, that's what he's doing. He's saying the songbook equates to baptism. And this kind of thing. He makes no difference. So this whole thing you're going to see comes back again, as I've said all along, number one, with the right attitude toward the authority of God's Word, how to ascertain it, and the willingness to submit to it. And it's in the ascertaining part that he has a problem, at least there, besides maybe other places. But he goes ahead to say, this paper explores ways to bring about the fulfillment of Jesus' and Paul's prayer for singularity of purpose. Now that's significant. Singularity of what? He didn't say anything about action. He said singularity of purpose. Make them define their terms. Read very close, or you'll read into it what you already think. And if you're right, you'll think they're saying the same thing. That's not without design by these people. Now he goes further. Since my personal ministry is primarily confined within the parameters of the churches of Christ, 
I feel that a part of my ministry is to help correct the abuses of God's Word. Now listen to this. The abuses of God's Word handed down to us from our forefathers. And that's what you're hearing all over the place. That the reason we've got division over mechanical instruments of music, the missionary society, and various other things is because of the big mess our forefathers made out of this. They didn't know what they were doing. Now we know. And we've got to erase all that stuff. And if we can get rid of those mistakes they made back there in the 19th century, it started back there, been perpetuated through the, most of the 20th century, then we can get back to have the unity for which Christ prayed. And that's what he's saying. So he says this movement, and he puts it in parentheses, Campbell Stone, any time. You, you're talking about catch words? You're talking about words that really say set up and take notice as to what this person really is? When you start hearing people refer to the church as the Campbell Stone movement or a product of the Campbell Stone movement, you know you've got a problem right there. Don't ever get to the point where you can't know enough about issues to recognize their uh, uh, identifying words that says, here's a flag, this tells you what it is. I heard Brother G.K. Wallace say one time back in the hippie days when they had the real long hair. He said, well, it's just a flag. That long hair just is a flag waving in the air to tell you where they're coming from and their philosophy and outlook on life. That's exactly right. It was radical. It was, it was trying to say we're going against everything that's been established. Remember the establishment? Of course, now they're about to take over the White House again. But nevertheless, that's, that's the situation. So you got that in the church. Now watch. This movement, Campbell Stone, started out as a unity movement. Well, it, it sounds good. But I want to know what he means when he says it started out as a unity movement. Why is it then that when you go back and read Restoration Literature, they're really trying to say, what is the final authority determining right and wrong in God's eyes? They were concerned about denominationalism. That's true. They knew it wasn't what Christ prayed for and what Paul commanded. But in order to figure out how to have the oneness that the Bible taught, they didn't just start going out here and say, well, let's just all buddy up and call God our Father and Christ our Savior, and the rest of it doesn't make any difference. They start trying to say, what is the standard that will govern us? And that's the reason it was back to the Bible. And where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where it's silent, we're silent. So it started out as a unity movement, he says, but soon crystallized the warring factions. Well, you know, when you read your New Testament, you can say that about the church and what he's using it that you read of in your own New Testament as you go through the whole thing. Today, for example, he says, within the churches of Christ, one soon discovers that there are approximately 25 divisions. Well, I don't know how he came to all that, but that's what he says. Each claiming to be the loyal church. Well, there's some of these divisions on each, each one of them, at least one of them doesn't claim to be. They just try to claim everybody's all right, so that doesn't really work. Each group maintains that it's speaking where the Bible speaks and it's silent where the Bible is silent. Well, that may be true with some of them, but there's some of them saying it doesn't make any difference what the Bible says, so we just all get together. That's this person. For one not to subscribe to the orthodoxy of a particular group is to receive the label false prophet. Whenever a distinctive religious group sets forth its interpretation of a singular scripture, then for one to disagree with that traditional exposition is tantamount to disagreeing with God himself. Now, that's not altogether true. That's just a blanket spread over everything. In this philosophy of explanation, one does not distinguish between one, one's critique of God's Word and the Word of God itself. Now, you tell me what that means. Think about it. In this philosophy of explanation, one does not distinguish between one's critique of God's Word and the Word of God itself. If one group sets forth a perception of Scripture that does not conform to the status quo of another camp, then the, quote, at odds, unquote, fellowship is accused of not speaking where the Bible speaks. Unity among many churches of Christ is based upon conformity, not unity and diversity. But numerous churches of Christ are returning to the biblical concept of unity and diversity. Now, there it is. And if he wants to come, if that's as he's going to come, probably to a proposition. That unity and diversity is authorized by the New Testament. That is the biblical concept. So he says, and as a result, this stance on unity and diversity by many elders and preachers, the unity and conformity group labels the unity and diversity fellowship as false teachers or liberal brethren. That's right, and you are. That's exactly right, and we'll see that more in just a moment. Because it's really union and diversity, and it does not recognize Bible authority, and it does not recognize the difference in obligatory matters and the options used to discharge those obligations. In other words, they don't recognize the difference in the obligation for a person to become a Christian, to be baptized, and the baptistry. That's really what it comes down to. Or 
the stream or the swimming pool or wherever the water is deep enough to bury somebody in. And then I, all these things become just matters of hindrances. And you're going to see as out of this attitude, we'll talk about that in a minute, that the Bible is referred to not as a book of rules, not as a book of instruction, but it's called a love letter. Well, you can interpret that to be true, a love letter in the sense the Bible, because of God's love, is given to man to guide him. But that's not what they mean by that when they say love letter. They simply say, well, it declares God's love to a lost mankind, whatever your view of how you got lost and what sin is, that you can't do anything to save yourself, that God intervened through Jesus Christ, and therefore to acknowledge the fatherhood of God and Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the Savior of the world, uh, that's all you really need to do. Everything else is peripheral. And that's what basically is called the bullseye core gospel. You just get the core of it. The rest of it we shouldn't divide over. Uh, and that's the reason they say, well, you've got all these other, quote, Christians out here and all these other religious groups because don't they believe in the fatherhood of God? Don't they believe in Christ as Savior? Don't they declare they need Christ? So where's the big deal? And therefore just come down to that. The only problem with that is if you go there, I guarantee you you're going to find somebody saying, well, you know, the Hindu concept of God or gods is considerably different from ours, but that's the best they can do in the culture that they have lived in. So who am I to say that God is going to say that they're wrong? So it gets you right into Unitarianism, Universalism, to where God's so loving, he won't cause anybody to be lost, no matter how you live your life. That's where all this stuff goes to when you carry it to its ultimate and logical conclusion. And so everything in between where the truth is and what truth actually is, an obligatory standard that is the same to everybody, no matter whether you're male or female, poor or whatever, all the way out to this God's going to save everybody because he loves everybody, no matter how you live, everything in between there, as far as they're concerned, all right. And you know who the real bad people are? Us. God's love won't save us. I promise you that. It'll save everybody else, but they won't allow God's love to save us because, Michael, we're very toxic. <laughs> we're very toxic. And for those who are not educated on half loose words, that means you're poison is an old snake. That's what, now, why are we very toxic? We say you've got to do what Christ said. That's a bad, isn't that terrible? That's wicked, Alan. You call Jesus Lord, all right? That means you do what he said, don't you? Oh, no. He's my Lord. I'm going to do what he said. Well, that's not only rebellion. It's stupid. I have deliberately substituted union for unity. Now, should I get to this more in the title of this particular chapter? I did this because of what Burdett and others believe and teach about, quote, oneness in belief and practice, unquote. Simply put, they're calling for a union without unity. It's doublespeak. It it's, doesn't make any sense. You let a person invent his terms or redefine old terms, he can teach anything in the world he wants to, right? So this is what they mean by, mean by unity and diversity when it comes to members of the church. It's really a union. You, you pretty well believe whatever you want to, and it's all all right. And we shouldn't divide over it. So unity and diversity in matters of obligation is in reality... Is this the right word, Ken? Oxymoron. Something that does not exist. In the case of unity and diversity, it only exists in really the rebellious and fermented minds of ignorant and wicked men. Now watch this. It goes against the very nature of what an absolute objective standard is. A thing cannot be completely wet and completely dry at the same time. It can't be or completely cold and completely hot at the same time, to the same degree, or one cannot be lost in sin and saved from sin at the same time. It's an impossibility. Let me show you how hard that is to understand. Take your four-year-old, say he's got a tricycle or some sort of toy, and he can't find it. So he comes to uh, parents or grandparent and wants to know where his tricycle is. Well, what you do, you tell him, you get his attention, and you say, it's in the house. And in the backyard, at the same time, now, he'll understand that, believe it or not. And he can look at you like, what have I got for parents? 
You tell him, well, it's not there in the backyard. No, it's over here in the, in the kitchen. But it's in both places, honey, at the same time. Now try that on a child sometime. Get on his level and maybe talk him, but, but say where he can understand you and get it over his mind that you're actually saying it's out there and in here. You'll be surprised how logical they already are because that's the way God made them. But we get up grown and go to school and learn so much stuff that when we try to tell adults that, well, it's in the backyard and in the kitchen at the very same time. And people say, isn't that wonderful? We've found a way to unity. That's, that's, you know, reduce a thing to the ultimate absurdity it is to make the point. Brethren, we need to start doing that. But that's what they call hateful and meaningful loving when you do that. And you know why they call it that? Because they're called to see themselves in the mirror. And they don't want to see themselves. They don't want to consider that I've got to do anything in order to be saved. And if I transgress it, then I'm wrong. People, people do not like things right or not right. They love the shadows. You ever notice that? They love the gray areas. Gray areas give you chances to go ahead and ease over into the bad part and still feel good about it. Just don't do too much sin. You know where it's going to hit us? It's already hitting us. It's being done secretly. It's through the Internet. And I promise you right now, there's no telling how many people assembled this morning to worship during this past week secretly on their computer or the Internet with viewing pornography. It's eating us up. I'm, I'm telling you that's happening. It's happening. And yet they're trying to justify themselves in it. It will work. And yet that's where we face it, and we're going to face it in the Lord's church. Expect more and more sexual perversion to come out among brethren. Oh, that can't happen. You ever read First Corinthians? And you ever wonder how it happened in those days? Well, for hundreds of years they'd lived that kind of life. It was natural to them. Natural in the sense they'd done it for so long they thought nothing about it. That's what Paul meant when he said the Ephesians, when by nature you do these things. He didn't mean that they inherited it like you do your genetic structure from your parents all the way back to Adam. He meant you've done it so long you don't think a thing wrong with it. That's where we're headed. We're headed to that. Now, Burnett believes that there are approximately 25 divisions of the churches of Christ. He alleges that these divisions are the result of following what he considers to be the false premise of unity in conformity in the place of unity in diversity. Well, think about this for a minute. Unity in conformity. To conform to something means that you have brought yourself into subjection to it somewhere or the other, have you ever wanted to wear a certain size dress or suit? Yeah. And therefore you get into the multi-billion dollar business of reducing to conform to a certain size. And it's interesting we understand that, but we can't understand the God of glory has given us the truth of God's word in a static standard that everybody can understand if they want to, but we deceive ourselves in thinking that in order to get out of this old sinful, bloated body governed by the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, we have to reduce to fit the divine pattern. Have you ever wondered about the straight and narrow way? S-T-R-A-I-T is the word straight, meaning a narrow, hemmed-in passage that you do not enter in very easily. Therefore, the way to heaven is a straight and narrow way. What does he mean? You cannot nonchalantly do as you please enter that way and stay in it and go to heaven. And there are people trying to enter that narrow passage, constricted him in on all sides by the authority of God's word, but they've got a big barrel of liquor on their back, or a big barrel of lying on their back, or they've got all sorts of laziness piled up there, and they keep trying to get in, but that big hump there won't let them in. Well, that's the idea you should get when you hear the Lord talk about the way to heaven being S-T-R-A-I-T, straight and narrow. What does that mean? It means I've got to divest myself of all those things in order to be obedient to God's word. And that conformity means I must conform to God's will. Look, baptism is a barrier of water. That is, the baptism one must obey to be saved. 1 Peter 3 and 21, Colossians 2, 12, Romans 6, 3 and 4. And so on every obligatory matter, a matter of obligation, you must do it. It's imperative, or you can't be saved, or you can't be faithful once you are saved from sin as a member of the church. Every one of those things says you have got to conform 
to the Lord's will. How do you know what the Lord's will is? God's word speaks the same way to everybody. You're back to ascertaining Bible authority, doing only what's authorized. And everybody, listen, can be in conformity to the teaching of 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. Be of the same mind and the same judgment. Is that not conformity? Believe the same thing. Is that not conformity? Well, it has nothing to do with the options. Paul and Barnabas disagreed, rather, whether it was best, whether it was expedient, whether the best option was to take John Mark with them or leave him alone. They couldn't get along over that. But it had nothing to do with the obligation they were seeking to discharge because they both went on their own way discharging the obligation in full unity of 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. Well, in a church, and I'll close here, how do you have any of these options where this church chooses options that are different from another congregation to carry out and discharge the same obligation? God in His wisdom gave us elders. That's the reason you're taught in Hebrews 13, 17, Oh, pay them that have any rule over you. Is that as plain as Acts 2, 38? How can we be so determined on one and so loose on the other? Well, obey them in what? Oh, they get up here and tell us we're going to have to be baptized be saved any longer. We're going to move mechanically from the music into the works. No, that's already been decided. Well, then in what way are we to obey them? When they collectively, understanding the obligation, seek what this congregation can do in order to discharge the obligations, which obligations are the same for everybody in every church on this earth that is a church of Christ and all that, that means. That's how the unity, even in matters, of option can be diverse, but one that still exists. That's exactly how it works. There, there's no reason to think that union and diversity can be applied to those things that are obligatory. That's the reason I said in the beginning, you must know how to ascertain Bible authority and you must respect it and know the difference in things that are obligatory that Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 1.10 that we must be all the same mind the same judgment. And then I must be of the same mind and the same judgment on that body of doctrine that teaches me in matters of option concerning the church. The elders have the final say as to when we're going to meet. When they all collectively come to the decision of what time we're going to meet, whether we're going to have a lectureship like this, a gospel meeting, who's going to do what, well, the Bible didn't spell it out and say, now we want the Spring Church of Christ to have a lectureship on this week. Well, then how, where's the authority to have such a thing as this? Under the general obligation to preach the gospel and edify the saints. And they choose this option to accomplish this. And when they decide it, and if it's what this congregation is capable of doing, then while another church may not want to have a lectureship, but it's doing something else over the place. Well, there's diversity, but it's an option. It's not an obligation. It's an option on how to carry out the same obligation. What is the obligation? Teach the same gospel. No churches are right not to do that, and if they try not to do it, they're going to hell. You pervert it anyway. So yes, there can be unity in diversity relative to options, and there are, even in the church. And the Lord took care of that, as the elders having the final say so, all things being done according to the will of God. But then in matters of what one must do to be saved from sin, and one must do to be faithful, one of them would be to obey Hebrews 13, 17, God the elders too. Then relative to baptism, the kind of music God wants, we have to sit down and think, well now, is this, is this thing what God says all men must believe and do? in order to be saved. And if it is, once we learn how to do it, we don't give up on it. So if somebody comes along nowadays, I'm going to quit here and says, mechanical instrumental music is not a bit different from the song books. Now they tried that a hundred and some odd years ago. But that's because they don't realize the difference in when God says all he wants to say about it in the New Testament concerning worship and music, he says, sing, 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 sing. And he tells what you sing, Psalms and spiritual song. He tells you the right attitude of mind. There is nothing in the will of the Lord relative to any other kind of music. Now, the king has the last say in the matter, being a king. I'm in his kingdom. I'm to do what he said. So if I preach only what the New Testament says regarding worship and music, what can I preach and what can I do to know I'm absolutely right? I'm going to preach sing. Well, but it doesn't hurt to play. Where's your authority? Brethren, I will close on this. We would settle a lot of arguments when people come up and say, well, what's wrong with it? You ask them this. Well, where's your New Testament authority for believing in the first place? And they're going to look at you cross-eyed because they won't know what to do. No, I want to know your authority for doing this. Where does King Jesus, you do acknowledge him as king, don't you? What does he, acknowledge, what does he declare unto you in the New Testament that you're authorized to do this thing you're advocating? 
And the average member of the church won't know what you're talking about. That's how far removed they are now from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, and rightly dividing the word of truth, and their appreciation of the authority of the Bible, and the need to abide by and do only what is authorized. That's the way to true unity, prayed for by Jesus and commanded by Paul, and it destroys union and diversity in matters of obligation. Thank you. Thank you, David, for, for a fine lesson. I think he's very well set the groundwork.